Benjamin Herskovich is a policy analyst at the CIS, but Ben is based in Beijing. We're, we're joining the Global Age at CIS. We have a Beijing staff member. We're about to put uh, one of our other staff is leaving us to go to Kuala Lumpur, but staying on staff. Before joining CIS, he was a desk officer at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, where he served on the Pakistan desk and worked on the, Dep on the, on the department's public diplomacy programs. He also recently submitted a PhD thesis that advances the liberal theory of federal federalism. His academic research spans philosophy, political theory, and political science, and he has published in all three disciplines. At CIS, he is working on social policy issues, including Asia literacy, multiculturalism, and social mobility, and foreign policy. Thank you. It's really good to be with you all this evening. I want to start with a brief anecdote. So I've been the CIS's Beijing correspondent of sorts for about four months now. In one of my first meetings on the ground, I was told the story of a TV cameraman who works for a Western news organization. It's a bit sensitive, so let's just call him Mr. X. In 1989, Mr. X was a young and idealistic university student. He was in Tiananmen Square, dodging bullets and risking life and limb quite literally for democracy and freedom. Less than 25 years later though, he's got a spacious apartment in a middle class suburb. He also has a wife and children and drives a European car. Today, if you asked Mr. X about democracy, he'd probably just shrug his shoulders. Mr. X, by all means, wants less corruption. He wants fewer smog-choked days and a fairer legal system. But, and this is the crucial point, he is in no mood to be in the firing line again in the name of regime change. So, in a very real sense, the Chinese Communist Party's rule is an insult to democracy. But Mr. X would say that it's made him comfortable and content. As my co-panelists have suggested, there are real reasons for concern about the health of democracy in the developed world. And I'm sorry to say that I'm basically going to add to the gloom. My argument is essentially Mr. X's story. It's that there are serious questions that need to be asked about democracy's prospects in the developing world too. So it's commonly thought that as countries become wealthy, they also become democratic. Newly assertive middle class consumers demand open and accountable democratic government and handcrafted French handbags alike. From Taiwan and South Korea to Turkey and Tunisia, it's thought that democracy rises on the surging prospects of the middle class. And the megatrends seem to confirm this really happy and very encouraging story. As the world grows richer, democracy flourishes. On the eve of World War I in 1914, global GDP per capita was only approximately 1,500 US dollars. And there were a mere 15 or so democracies worldwide, depending on how you define democracy. Now, with rapid industrialization in East Asia and following that, the rest of the developing world, the number of democracies climbed to 35 in the 1970s. And it reached 96 in 2011. And this was just as global GDP per capita surged to a little shy of US $12,000. Going against this really positive and encouraging story, the connection between rising middle class prosperity and democratization now faces one of its most formidable tests yet. And I assume it'll come as no surprise that when I say that, I'm talking about China. The Middle Kingdom has a massive and growing middle class. It's estimated to be at more than 400 million today, and that's according to HSBC. And the expectation is that it'll balloon to something in the order of 1.3 billion by mid-century. And that basically means that the vast majority of Chinese people at that point in time will be middle class, something like 92%. Despite this, though, the country shows no sign of freeing itself from the grip of authoritarianism. The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP for short, doesn't tolerate any challenge to the one-party state. It controls the judiciary, it censors the internet, and it keeps more than 1,400 political activists behind bars. 
There are a lot of other points that can be made about that, but that's just a flavor of the extent of the authoritarianism in China. This peculiar combination of material abundance and authoritarianism is a serious challenge to the connection between the middle class and democracy. And it probably leaves us asking whether the worldwide wave of democratization will finally crash on the Great Wall of China. Many of us probably find it quite comforting to think that the Chinese political system will eventually be forced to democratize or die. And conveniently enough, we're in really good company if we hold that view. Min Xin Pei, a world-renowned China scholar, maintains that China's current system is simply morally and intellectually bankrupt. He forcefully argues that it offers no future for the Chinese people. And this is essentially the consensus view. According to most experts, it's not just authoritarian China's economic, social, environmental, and political problems that'll make democratic reforms essential. Although, as we can discuss later, these problems are both serious and numerous. Crucially, the widely held view is that a self-assured Chinese middle class will demand more political freedom from government. It's really easy for middle class liberals in developed democracies to assume that their peers in the developing world want the same political rights and freedoms that they cherish. And that's probably the position of many of us. There is one really serious problem with this natural inclination though. It's that at best, interest in political freedom is lukewarm among China's middle class. Survey data from across China certainly shows that the middle class is eager to protect numerous individual rights and liberties. More than 90% support the protection of rights to work, to education, to free information, to privacy of personal correspondence, and to travel abroad. While more than 80% support the protection of rights to reside anywhere in the country and worship freely. So what this suggests is that middle class Chinese obviously want personal freedoms, but if we start talking about political freedoms, if we start talking about democracy, the story is remarkably different. As much as 75% of the Chinese middle class, that's three in every four Chinese middle class people, think that they don't need to participate in government decision making. And only 25% think that multiple parties should be able to contest elections. What's more, fully 86% of middle class Chinese respect their authoritarian political system, and 83% believe that the CCP represents their interests. If that's not bad enough, it actually gets worse. Only 23% and 24%, respectively, support rights to protest and form non-CCP civil society organizations. I could go on with more numbers that highlight the lack of interest in political freedom. But the point is clear enough, I think. With one party rule firmly entrenched in China, the country certainly suffers from a massive and severe democratic deficit. But it ultimately seems that the middle class just doesn't care. The question of why middle class Chinese have such an easygoing attitude towards authoritarianism is both really interesting and really quite important. And we can get into that in the Q&A time. Right now though, the important point is that we need to start asking the question of what will become of democratization in China and the connection between the middle class and democracy. You might think that given the really gloomy picture that I've painted for you so far, that we'll end up with some kind of political stasis. There won't be political change because there's no democratic hunger in China. This kind of pessimism will seem in all likelihood really plausible. On the one hand, we have the Chinese middle class's democratic indifference. They just don't seem to care that much about it. And then on the other hand, we have what is an unyielding commitment to perpetuating a monopoly on political power on the part of the CCP. The kind of bleak assessment that says that there will be political stasis though, ignores the CCP's strong reformist impulses. 
Beijing, in actual fact, exhibits genuine resolve to respond to middle class concerns and public discontent more broadly. The CCP has launched initiatives to tackle chronic pollution and it plans to clamp down on corruption. It wants to overhaul a deeply unpopular regime of forced land seizures. It also wants to mitigate income inequality and it wants to enact at least slightly more enlightened policies in west of western provinces such as Tibet and Xinjiang. And all the while, it also wants to fuel the continual rise of the middle class by securing ongoing economic expansion. This looks like the start of a really encouraging reform process, but there are some things that we have to acknowledge before we get caught up in the idea that the CCP is a truly enlightened organization which is taking us in the right direction. There are communist hardliners and vested interests that stand in the way of these kinds of positive policy initiatives. There are rusted on leftists and opportunists and they don't want change because they're either still committed to communist ideology or they're having a great time on the public teat. At the same time, Beijing's reformism is probably in part calculated to secure the CCP's political survival. The CCP, for all its failings, is without question savvy enough to know that if it wants to rule in perpetuity, it needs to keep the Chinese people, and the middle class in particular, broadly happy with the shape of government. But whatever the challenges and the motivation, Beijing's reformism also represents a very real, as well as a potentially very successful, attempt to make government more responsive and accountable within the framework of one party rule. So this brings me to the key point that I want to stress in this presentation. The CCP's ambitious reform agenda points to a great irony in contemporary China. The CCP is able to preempt possible middle class opposition and thereby stave off its political demise precisely by making China's political system more responsive and accountable. This signals the emergence of what I call a model of quasi-democracy in China. The CCP is anxious to minimize potentially explosive dissatisfaction with government, and as a result, seeks to enact policies broadly in keeping with society's wishes. There won't be open and free multi-party elections in China anytime soon, but we can be sure that there'll be less closed door and rigid decision making. This effectively means that China under the CCP will probably turn out to be a phantom menace to the connection between democracy and the middle class. And I think that's the real lesson of Mr. X's story, the story that we started with. He might not be interested in full-blown liberal democracy anymore, but he wants a measure of democratic accountability in the form of open and fair legal system and more effective public policy. I want to conclude and predict China's future by going back two decades. 1992 saw the publication of one of the most influential post-Cold War works of political science. Frank's The End of History and the Last Man. Its core claim was that liberal democracy constitutes the best possible solution to the human problem. I'm strongly of the view that this is still true, but as what I've said suggests, we arguably need to add one important qualification. Quasi-democratic authoritarian systems, which offer a measure of accountability and responsiveness in the absence of democratic rights and freedoms, offer a fairly good solution to the human problem not a great solution, but a fairly good one. And that's why there is so much satisfaction in China in general with the authoritarian system that they have. In 1998, US President Bill Clinton was extremely critical of Beijing as a result of its failure to live up to what he called liberal democratic ideals. He made plain that he thought the regime was on the wrong side of history. Now, I have no doubt that that's true of the CCP's brutal, bloody, and ultimately intellectually bankrupt Maoist past. But by pursuing a moderate reformist agenda within the framework of one party rule, the CCP may yet carve out an enduring place at the end of history for its own brand of quasi-democratic authoritarianism. Thank you.